Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, really, I'm, I'm so pleased to introduce Maria Paula Mugnani to all of you and her research, along with the, the incredible support of uh, Nick Maselko, Pierre Gonos, and others uh, who've been in the field collecting that collecting data with MP. Maria Paula Mugnani, whom we affectionately call MP, I should say. Um, I think that one of the things that the, the Penny Pack Trust uh, did when we transitioned between executive directors is that they knew that they were not going to have a scientist at the, at the head of the table for the Penny Pack Trust. And I knew that that was a weakness on the part of the trust. And I think that MP really exemplifies uh, research and restoration efforts uh, in the 21st century and also for the Penny Pack Trust. And it is very clear, and it will be very clear to you through this presentation that she has reached back uh, to the data that was produced by uh, David Robertson and others in previous decades. And she weaves a brilliant story about the ecology of riparian conditions, uh, the main stem of the Penny Pack and the tributaries that the Penny Pack Trust tries to protect, tries to protect and really does a fantastic job of um, bridging the decades and making sure that the science is relevant and, and fascinating, truly fascinating uh, for mm -hmm. those of us who live so close to this stream and live in this watershed. Maria Paula, thank you so much for this presentation. I hope you all enjoy it. Thank you very much, Chris, for that intro. It's been great to be here at the Trust. I've just been here just over a year and it's been amazing the opportunities. The Penny Pack Trust has been a really welcoming community and there's just so many interesting research opportunities here. So it's been great to, to dive into uh, water quality, which is our um, reaches back to our beginnings as a watershed association. So very important work here. And I'm glad to be continuing it from a legacy of previous um, researchers. So today we're going to be uh, talking about aquatic macroinvertebrates and how they can be um, indicators of water quality. So um, what you're looking at here is a baited mayfly nymph. And if you've ever picked up a rock, um, you may have come face to face with one of these and not even known it. You may have looked into the water a little more closely and seen some of our freshwater um, scuds. These are uh, crustaceans that we find in the creek or maybe even some caddisfly larvae in their little um, cases that they make that then become these uh, adult caddisflies that are attracted to our porch lights. We see them in our lawns at dusk and we often confuse them for moths. Um, but macroinvertebrates are all around us in both aquatic form and adult form. Um, I'll break down this term for you a little bit. Um, the macro part refers to how it can be seen with the naked eye, no microscope uh, scope necessary. And like invertebrates, they lack a spine. So the perfect example here is uh, the water penny next to the nickel. You can see that pretty clearly. And these are aquatic organisms that can either live their whole lives in the water, uh, such as crustaceans, different uh, clams and uh, worms. These are all freshwater organisms or terrestrial insects that actually live part of their early stages, mostly nymph and larval within the water before emerging as adults. And we look for these in both the fast water riffles within the Pennypack Creek, but also slower moving water bodies. Um, some of these organisms can exist. So just a few examples here. We looked at the baited mayfly. On the left here is the adult form with its wings. I'm sure many of you in the summertime have seen them flying around. Um, and then to the right, here they are. Um, here's a nymph in the water. Uh, another example here is this stonefly. 
um, and then the the nymph form to the right again. Um, so there, um, there's a quite a difference. There's some similarities between their um, aquatic stages and their adults, but these are two different life stages of the same organism. So uh, macroinvertebrates, or I just refer to them as macros, um, just as a shorthand, they have different lengths of their life cycles. But I'll give you an example here with the mayfly. Um, we start with um, an adult that will lay eggs in directly in the water or in, on a rock, um, let's say in the creek. These eggs will, um, in the right conditions, hatch and develop into a nymph which um, for mayflies, it can be even you know, a year or two before they actually emerge from the water and become um, duns and eventually spinners and, and become adults again. So the macro stage is this nymph stage in the water. And it, if you look into mayflies, especially, it's very fascinating just how, how, um, um, how intricate this, this life cycle can be in that you know, as soon as they emerge as adults, which tends to be kind of early summer, they may live two minutes if a trout eats them, or maybe just a couple of days. And it's a race to kind of mate and lay those eggs uh, to secure the population in that area. Um, but in general, um, this can take place usually about a year to a couple of years, depending on the organism. And we're interested in the aquatic stage for macros. You can often pick up a rock at the, uh, in the Pennypack Creek and see those egg masses for the different um, macros in the stream, if you look closely. Uh, for fly fishermen, I know we have a couple here tonight. Uh, a lot of them are interested in macros to um, uh, mimic them, to catch uh, their trout and other fish. Um, you can see the comparison here with the yellow stonefly. They can mimic them quite well. Um, to then be able to uh, catch the fish. And it's especially important to pay attention to what cycle the macro is at that moment to be able to mimic what's in the water so you can uh, trick the, the trout uh, most effectively. So uh, let me introduce a couple of our macro taxa here. These are different orders. Uh, we have Trichoptera, Plecoptera, and Ephemeroptera. These are our caddisfly, stoneflies, um, and mayflies. And these are our three most sensitive groups. They tend to uh, have very strict preferences for uh, aquatic conditions. And they, they're on the pickier side. So pretty sensitive to um, worse conditions, low oxygen, things like that. A couple other uh, taxa that we look uh, at and you'll find in the Pennypack Creek, we've got the Coleoptera, which are the beetles, uh, Odonata, which are dragonflies and damselflies, and Diptera, which are the flies. And I will say our most common flies here are the black flies and the non-biting midges. So we'll see those um, in their aquatic form quite a bit. So if I were to ask you what role macros played in their aquatic settings, a lot of you would probably say, well, they're fish food. And that would be like a very obvious and correct answer. There are also food for amphibians and birds. Like without them, there would be a, a massive loss uh, in food sources for a lot of these organisms. They're also food for each other. We have um, certain macros um, like this narrow winged damselfly nymph is a, a predator kind of macro. So they have mandibles that allow them to eat other macroinvertebrates. Um, and this, uh, this is mostly the damselfly group, but also the beetles and some of the stoneflies can be um, uh, predators. If we were to look a little bit deeper, we would see that there are some functional feeding roles within our macroinvertebrate groups. So we have the shredders, which um, these are, they take uh, large pieces of plants, leaves, flowers, things that either wash into the creek 
or fall in directly and they chew these down into smaller pieces. So these are the, the stone fly and some of the caddis flies. Um, then we also have scrapers and grazers. Um, these are, have specialized brushes on their lips that allow them to scrape away algae growing on the rocks. They really keep the amount of algae in the creek in check. And these are a mayfly, water penny, um, caddis flies. And oops, see one more group here. My super stock. There we go. <laughs> so well, the last group we have are called collectors. So these are more on the bottom of the food chain, so to speak. They they love the smaller organic particles. So this is where the fly group comes in, the black fly, the midges, um, and certain kind of caddis fly, like the net spinning type. They actually have specific adaptations to capture the small organic particles um, in these silk webs, kind of like spiders do, and then they can feed off of these webs. Really interesting adaptations across the board. Uh, and the reason I'm telling you about these groups is to stress that this is this is the community. This is the macro invertebrate community, and we need we need a taxa in every group here to have a healthy functioning community. So that means we want a diverse group of macro invertebrates to cover all these feeding roles. Um, these macros are essentially cleaning the water for us. Um, if, if we're getting organic material constantly in the creek, we don't want all this um, leaves and plant matter blocking up our creeks and, and filling up the, the water bodies. These guys are with microbes and other organisms. They're really breaking things down. Um, it's very similar to in forests where we have uh, leaves piling up in the fall. We have worms and cockroaches and beetles breaking down those leaves and organic material into um, soil essentially and, ca and carbon. So this is the aquatic version of that. Um, and as you might expect, you can learn a lot about the uh, food availability in these, organ uh, in these um, environments based off what taxa is present. So if you have a lot of collectors, uh, there's probably a lot of organic matter small particles in the water or um, a lot of scrapers. Well, there's probably a lot of algae in, in on the rocks there. So you can learn a lot about um, the water quality and the water environment just looking at these groups. Here's a really cool adaptation by the net spinning caddis fly, literally making a net and then just kind of waiting for something to float by and to, to snatch it up. Just really amazing organisms. So uh, beyond food availability, obviously there's some other factors that influence what macros are present in the creek. Um, the big one here is oxygen. So certain macros, um, they have uh, siphons or they can just directly absorb um, oxygen through their um, permeable skin, or they can just resurface to the top of the water. And, and those taxa really, they don't, um, they don't particularly, uh, they're not particularly picky about the oxygen level. So they can tolerate really low um, oxygen levels. And so oxygen is generally um, governed by the amount of particles in the water. And so if you have a lot of these, um, organisms that don't, um, don't care about oxygen levels, you generally have some pollution um, in that water. Um, and I can explain that further with the other group here. Um, other macros have gills um, circled here in white. Um, these basically, uh, they, they move them or they, they pump their bodies to get water flowing through these gills and they're able to filter out the oxygen. So um, these macros, they need a high level of dissolved oxygen in the water uh, to, be able to, to, uh, to be available to uh, persist. And um, any sort of uh, substrate or particles in the water make it really difficult to 
filter out that oxygen. So they're quite sensitive to a lot of particulates or pollution in the water because it makes it hard to breathe, um, which is, uh, so we can look at these groups and, and uh, depending on their numbers, know how much oxygen is in the water. Um, and there are some other factors beyond oxygen that um, can dictate what the species are present. Um, and that goes back to the uh, topic of pollution. When I um, say pollution, I'm not just thinking of substances like um, chemicals, road salts, um, household industrial pollution. I'm also talking about organic and nutrient pollution. So that might mean um, silts that flow into the water, um, any sewage or fertilizers, or just a lot of like leaves and, and plant particles, those can really make the water cloudy. You know, like when you cloud up the water, that's a lot of substrate in there that um, makes it harder to filter out oxygen. So having these um, higher, um, these sources of pollution in the water can also um, make it so only the most tolerant groups uh, can survive. Another factor is temperature, and this can be really seasonal, right? So some of the ma uh, macros prefer cooler water temperatures, so they tend to hang out in the riffles. And, uh, but as you can imagine, the summer temperatures in a stream that's unshaded um, can be very hard on those that prefer cooler, uh, cooler water. Um, additionally, um, algal blooms can occur in warmer temperatured waters and you tend to have poorer oxygen um, in these uh, warmer waters. So we actually know, um, just based off the functional groups, um, we know what species, um, what taxa are tolerant, sensitive, um, and just kind of in the middle here. So we can group them depending on um, their, their tolerance. So kind of the, the top three here for, for tolerance to look at are um, oxygen levels, um, organic and chemical pollution, and water temperatures. So uh, we can start with the sensitive group. Those um, are basically our, our stoneflies, our mayflies, and our caddisflies with gills. And then we also have um, riffle beetles and water pennies are more sensitive to these three metrics. Um, in the middle, we have um, less sensitive taxa, which include net spinning caddisfly, crane fly, um, damselfly, and, and some crustaceans. Our, our most tolerant um, taxa are the, are the flies and the lunged snails. And I think it's very um, easy to kind of vilify this tolerant group. Uh, but in fact, they're actually kind of, the, in a way, they're the most fit to be in these, um, in, in water environments, because they can kind of take anything that comes their way and, uh, and do just fine. Uh, what's important here is that, again, we want a diverse environment for all the functional roles to be fulfilled. So um, we want these uh, less sensitive and sensitive uh, taxa as well. Um, but with this knowledge, we can actually look at water quality um, by looking at what's there. And if we get a lot of sensitive species, we know that the water quality is, is fairly good. Um, so we can survey an area and determine water quality just based off the tax of present. So I want to talk about um, some research that was done at the Trust in the 80s by our previous director, Dr. David Robertson. Um, he published a paper on this research. I'd be happy to share with people um, if requested. I'll talk a little a, a snippet about it. So um, in the 80s, there was a secondary sewage treatment plant just above um, Davisville Road. Um, if you know where that is in uh, relation to Pennypack Creek, that with its effluent water was uh, releasing a lot of nutrient pollution in the water. And Dr. Robertson was curious as to how that was affecting water quality. 
And so he set up and he wanted, he wanted to use um, the macroinvertebrates as a proxy for water quality. So uh, whatever he found in the water could tell him a lot about the quality. So he set up some sites um, above the treatment plant and below. So you would affect so you would expect everything above would be uh, conditions before the nutrient pollution, and then uh, the spots below would be after pollution. So above the plant, he found a relatively high species richness. So a lot of different, um, different macroinvertebrate taxa were present. And that included a lot of the sensitive taxa like mayfly, stonefly, and uh, caddisflies. Um, then he went down below the treatment plant and he found that the amount of species dropped by 50%. Um, and then the most dominant uh, taxa there were those, those more tolerant macroinvertebrates. That's, those were the black flies and the non-biting midge, those, um, um, those like small particulate feeders that we talked about before. But he also noticed that as you went further down the creek from this treatment plant, uh, some of these um, taxa actually came back. Some of these mayfly and stonefly returned to the creek. And so he had the idea that several tributaries, some smaller streams, um, were, had higher quality water conditions and were kind of feeding into the creek and diluting the effects, the nutrient pollution from the, the plant and thus introducing the water conditions that could sustain these, um, these uh, more sensitive taxa, things like uh, more oxygen and, and less um, pollution. So, so uh, here at the trust, we have, our main stem here in blue. This uh, orange outline is the, these are the boundaries of the truss um, here in Huntington Valley. And the, the blue is our main stem. That's the Pennypack Creek. It's 22 miles long and extends up north of us. We have within our trust boundaries, we have two um, tributaries, small streams that originate um, outside of the trust. And, and feed into the creek. For reference, this uh, yellow star is where our offices are. And the, the, the blue um, circle is the, what's known as Crossroads Marsh or the Beaver Pond. So we have um, like a more northerly site and a southern trib. Um, and just giving you a kind of closer look, Karen Run um, empties out into the creek just below Paper Mill Bridge over by Crossroads Marsh. And uh, Mitchell Run runs kind of through um, Lord's New Church before crossing over Creek Road and into the creek. So those are two tributaries um, in, at the trust. So we wanted to um, continue Dr. Robinson's work by looking at the water quality in these two tributaries. And we chose two sites um, along each tributary. Um, and these two sites were we wanted to see right at the mouth with the creek what the um, water quality was. And then we also looked above in another site um, in an area um, above a road um, to look at maybe if there were some impacts between the confluence and the upper portions um, to see if maybe there was like, for example, in Karen Run, there's a, a road and a, a bridge that runs um, over the creek, maybe above that area, there's slightly better water quality. So we wanted to kind of see if there was the, the water quality was continuous throughout both trips. So we picked two sites per, per tributary. And so we, did, we have one season under our belt so far here. In April, 2021, we did uh, field sampling at both sites. This is actually Peter Gunness, one of our volunteers. And we use um, server samplers, which are these um, frames that we can place over um, a riffle rock bed with a net in the back. We scrub those rocks 
and kind of disturb the sediments and the water flow flows all that gets kind of dredged up into this net. And so we can collect whatever was residing in that area. Um, we do several of these samples throughout a 90 foot transect. Um, and these follow methodologies um, established by the, the Stroud Research Center um, and other, um, other organizations nearby that work with water quality. Um, and we take, um, just so you know, but I can talk about this more if you've got questions, but we put two server samplers um, across in each bucket, we've got four buckets. And the reason we kind of mix these samples is because if there's any spatial variation in the macro invertebrate composition, we want to eliminate that kind of variability. So we combine samples. Um, we end up with uh, four buckets full of mixed sample, and we extract from each bucket two samples. So we end up with eight samples per site. Uh, and then we sort through the macroinvertebrates we've collected. I've kind of color coded these according to uh, kind of traffic lights. So green is sensitive, yellow is um, less sensitive, and then the red is you know, very tolerant of um, pollution. Um, so let's look at our results. So one of the uh, quick ways that scientists look at um, water quality using macros is to uh, do an EPT index. So that looks at ephemeroptera, plecoptera, and trichoptera. That's um, the mayfly, stonefly, uh, caddisflies. So just looking at out of all the different um, taxa we find in each site, how many of them are, um, are in these orders. And the reason we care about these orders is because they're the three of the most sensitive macros you can find. So um, in Karen Run Confluence, we found 20 taxa total. And um, on average, 28% of those um, were EPT. So, um, a, 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 you know, above a quarter of those were sensitive species, sensitive taxa, I should say. The reason I keep saying taxa is because with macroinvertebrates, we don't usually uh, identify down to the species level. Usually um, family or genus can tell us a lot um, about their water tolerance. So uh, species is not usually um, within our um, terminology here. In Karen Run, the upper site, we had a few more EPT, those sensitive taxa present. Um, and just we just found 15 there. So we do find some sensitive uh, taxa at Karen Run. Moving on to, moving on to Mitchell Run. We had um, at the stream of Mitchell Run, we found 19 taxa and 58% of them were uh, of the sensitive taxa. So that was really encouraging. We found uh, a lot of those individuals present. Over half of what we found were sensitive taxa. Over at the confluence, so further down towards the creek, um, we found 25 taxa and 48% of them were sensitive. So uh, a little bit less than in the stream, but still really uh, a good amount of sensitive taxa were found in these sites. So that's very encouraging, but again, we're looking at just the taxa level. We're, we haven't looked at abundance yet, just what uh, taxa are present, what macros are here. And luckily, we, we have a lot of, um, we have a decent amount of sensitives in these sites. And so the water quality is probably quite good to, to sustain them. However, <laughs> when we look at the abundance of these taxa, it tells a slightly different story. So um, this is mean 
amount per taxa. So let's uh, let's break that down a little bit. So that's we remember we had eight sites, eight um eight samples per site. We average the amount of so we average the amount of each taxa, um, you know, by to determine on average how many there were at each site. So let's say non-biting midge, on average at, um, I've got a bar in the way here. On average at the Karen Run confluence, we had about 125 present um, at that site uh, over, you know, an average of the eight samples we took. It's uh, a little less in Karen Run in the upper site, but then um, in relation to all the other tax that we find, it's, it's quite high. So um, if you're seeing turquoise here, <laughs> it's because there's a lot of just one taxa here, non-biting midge. So that's in diptera. These are the particulate feeders. So even if we have a good amount of sensitive taxa present, the abundance is overwhelmingly midge. Now, um, highlighted here in, in the black boxes at the top of each bar, we do have some mayfly and, and sensitive caddisfly, but they are in much lower abundances. Um, now here at the bottom highlighted, we have some stonefly, sensitive caddisfly and, and riffle beetle, um, but again, quite low abundances. So let's just look at the average tolerant. So that's just going back to the midge here. Um, this removes all the, um, the sensitive taxa. So what we have dominating here are the collector functional group. And you remember the collect collector group, they love detritus, they're bottom dwellers. They, they love feeding in the heavy sediments. They love organic pollution and they tolerate low dissolved oxygen. So the fact that we have a lot of midge means that we probably have a lot of sedimentation, you know, erosion of our, of our creek banks. They're eroding away, lots of sediments in the water, a lot of, um, a lot of plant matter, a lot of organic pollution that silts and things in the water that's, that's um, making those low oxygen conditions and, and plenty of detritus for these midge to feed on. Um, when we look at just the sensitive macros, notice here that the quantity goes down quite a bit. This, this scale bar before said 150, right? Now it's 12. <laughs> so, so we're looking at a much smaller abundance on average for these sensitive macro taxa. So across the board here, we get quite a, a good collection of the sensitive caddisflies. These have gills, um, so they need a, a good level of dissolved oxygen. Looks like um, the, the, the taxa, the different types of caddis present, it's pretty consistent throughout the sites. Um, uh, when we look at the mayflies, we've got the ephemeralid mayflies here in Karen Run. And then here we have a different type of mayfly, the baited mayfly and the amyletus. It's interesting that in these two, um, these two, these are the only mayfly taxa present. And it's interesting that they're distinct, you know, there's no overlap in mayfly taxa. So it makes you wonder if maybe there's slightly different conditions. And I've started to look at kind of what mayfly prefer and they tend to differ, different groups prefer different um, water temperatures, sediment loads, the water velocity, um, and so we may, I'll be interested for this next season in April to see if, if we, we again have distinct mayfly groups, but um, some of these factors may vary between the Mitchell Run and the Karen Run site, and that might be influencing why we have kind of distinct mayfly taxa. But again, this is just one season, so it could just be um, a fluke or just these, um, these particular groups uh, 
had good um, adult egg laying success. So they happen to be, um, you know, these, these, these uh, macros are tied to one specific area. So if the adult lays the egg in that spot and doesn't go much further, doesn't go to another trib, um, that's just purely because of the range. Um, it may not be reflecting the condition. So it'd be interesting to see the new season, what we get with that. Um, Pennsylvania, the Department of Environmental Protection just released this integrated water quality report. Um, and this is, they, they basically rate the watershed, different streams and creeks based off how they're, if they're meeting the, um, the standards for water quality. So um, are they above the maximum permissible um, a rate uh, allowable metric of pollution? Are they above, below? So unfortunately, uh, Pennypack Creek, which I've just outlined in red here, um, it is currently considered impaired by the state, uh, which means it is not meeting the standards for water quality. It is um, over polluted, basically. And what they're citing here as the cause is um, sewage and urban runoff. So this creek runs through 22 miles of parking lots, commercial areas, residential areas. So all that runoff from our parking lots and lawns, be it fertilizer or sediments, is all contributing to um, the impaired status of this creek. Um, interestingly, Mitchell Run and Karen Run, they were also reported on and they actually meet the standards. So <laughs> that's great. Um, and that really reflects what we saw in our macro um, collections that these sites are, are they, they must be fairly high quality if we're finding those sensitive macro invertebrates in there. You know, we do have a lot of midge, but uh, the water quality in terms of oxygen levels and pollution isn't uh, high enough to um, basically make the unlivable conditions for these sensitive taxa. So, you know, reflects what we found pretty well. Um, and we just compiled our chloride data. So if any of you are involved in winter salt watch, uh, monitoring, you know, with test strips, we've compiled that data from uh, the Pennypack watershed. We've got sensors and loggers out. And so we've, um, we found kind of similar things compared to the state report um, in orange here. That's uh, the chunk of the Pennypack Creek that we have data for. Um, and so you can see it's in the 120 to 230 chloride reading range um, for the years 2018 to 2021. Um, these are average readings and uh, looks like it's, it's, it's in the harmful range for macroinvertebrates. So um, definitely impaired and you know, similar results to what Pennsylvania found. But in um, Mitchell Run and Karen Run, um, we're kind of teetering at the, between um, less than 50 milligrams and 50. So I happen to know that both these sites average out to be about 50 milligrams per liter in chloride. So it, it kind of got bumped into the yellow range, but it's, it's probably usually in green. So chloride um, is not particularly high in these sites. And um, being at 50, it's probably not, um, it's probably not influencing the macro diversity so much because it's, it's, it's on the lower side. Um, I'd be interested, notice um, on the left picture here, this um, very thin red stream, that's Turwood Run. That's another tributary to the creek. It's just right outside the boundaries of the trust um, for the most part. And we don't sample there currently, but I would love to see just based on how it's impaired according to the state. And we don't have any data on it currently. I'd love to add that. Um, to the macro collections this year. So that's why I intend to add a third tributary to our, our sampling, see what we find there too. 
Um, I happened to see that in this report, there are two other sites along Pennypack Creek that uh, sampled the macroinvertebrates and they had very similar results. Um, this one is in Lorimer Park. So just um, below Old Ford Road. And they have some, they have, I've kind of color coded this according to tolerance. So red is tolerant, green is sensitive, yellow is less sensitive. So they have some, some of that baited mayfly. They've got some of the, the beetles and the gilled uh, caddis flies that are sensitive, but in terms of abundance, they have a lot of non-biting mage. So again, the creek is, has a lot of that nutrient pollution, um, just, uh, and it continues to have that down in, in Lorimer Park as well. Um, again, even further down near where the, um, we, we meet with uh, the Delaware um, down in Pennypack Park, very similar thing. Uh, We've got those sensitive mayfly and beetles, um, but lots of non-biting midge. So I just thought it was interesting that, that they also reflect our results, these two other sites. So by now, you're wondering how we could improve this water quality. How can we improve the Pennypack Creek? It's like super long and I mean, none of us are like dumping chemicals in there directly. A lot of this is just everyday life things that um, are part of our, our culture and our infrastructure that we don't really think about. So um, water runoff, um, a, a, big, a big piece of that is impervious surfaces. So all the pavement we have um, all the, in all the parking lots, anything that water can't filter through, that's running off directly into the creek. So if, if you're thinking about paving your driveway, um, not paving it would, would be helpful to allow that water to infiltrate rather than running off. Uh, for our impervious surfaces, proper storm management is key. I will talk about that more in a minute. But trying to limit our, our pollution sources so they don't end up in the creek, salt application is big. Do your research, look at Isaac Walton League of America. They have a lot of resources on this. Um, you don't need as much salt for your driveway or your walkways as you think. Um, again, fertilizers, pesticides, gasoline, um, the, the pet waste, picking it off is important. Otherwise all that fecal matter gets washed into the creek and that's bacteria and nutrient pollution. So all these sources, that are end up in our lawns or um, near our water bodies. We want to try to limit those. Um, reducing stream sedimentation, that's just our banks getting down cut, eroding away. Um, we at the trust, we plant a lot of riparian buffers. A lot of you are volunteers and you help us plant trees in these areas to hold the stream banks better, to, to solidify um, so solidify them so they don't just wash away as sediments. Um, so if you're a volunteer, thank you. You, you. you help a lot in helping us stabilize those buffers and, and those trees are also filtering out pollutants from the water. Um, if you want to do more volunteering for different water sampling programs through the Isaac Walton League, they do a lot of work there, a lot of organizations um, to be involved with. You can either even become a certified um, macroinvertebrate collector as well. Um, I want to explain the stormwater management with an example. Um, if you live, um, if your property is alongside a stream or even the Pennypack Creek, you have a tremendous opportunity to uh, help storm wa um, water quality and, and macroinvertebrate diversity. So if this is the view from your backyard, um, you're, you're probably thinking, um, I don't use fertilizer. If I don't use um, pesticides, that's, that won't wash into the creek. That's, that's great. If, if you apply them responsibly, um, that's, that helps a lot. Um, but whenever we get a heavy storm, uh, rainfall or we get a lot of snow melt, the, the grass down here doesn't actually um, 
uh, absorb a lot of the water, the, the soil here will become very quickly saturated. And then what will, what will happen is all the excess water will just wash right into this creek. You'll end up with, you know, thousands of these, re, re, these situations replicated across thousands of backyards. And you end up with the water level surging, you end up with flooding. The, the amount of water in the creek as it surges will erode the stream banks. And um, any organic matter, you know, leaves, plant parts, sediments, they wash into the water as well. So what I'm proposing here <laughs> is a rain garden. So if, if you haven't heard of a rain garden, um, there's been a lot of talk about introducing these to uh, riparian areas or areas that are um, chronically flooded and, and spill into creeks. These are basically swales you can dig out and using appropriate materials, you basically make a basin with native plants and all the water will collect here rather than flooding into the stream. And these plants, which will be you know, native and specially um, adapted for these wetter conditions will absorb any sort of pollutants They'll absorb the water and you won't have um, all that water and any sort of nutrients uh, flowing into the creek. The trust has currently uh, been working on a project in a homeowners association where they've established rain gardens and, and other organizations are also involved in, in building these. There's a lot of resources. So um, do your research. I would encourage you to look into this if this applies to you. And there's great pollinator um, benefits to these as well. If you don't have um, a, a stream or creek nearby your home, uh, looking for wet spots or um, any sort of sewer areas near your home, putting plants around there is also really helpful because any sort of sewage water um, could get absorbed by these plants and you could also um, just absorb any of those kind of saturated areas that could flow into smaller feeder streams and eventually make it to the creeks. So um, definitely explore rain gardens as an option. So before I, I close, I want to um, put a plug in for a couple of our um, partnering organizations. Uh, macroinvertebrates.org is this new amazing resource if you want to learn more about the anatomy and really look at these macros up close. Um, this is uh, by the Stroud Water Research Center. They just released this. It's amazing. So macroinvertebrates.org, great resource for learning more about um, all the macro taxa. Also, Isaac Walton League of America. Great, they've got a, a Creek Critter app to help you ID these in person. Um, they've got great resources for both uh, winter salt watch and macroinvertebrates. So great resources if you wanna learn more. And finally, I just wanna thank uh, the Pennypack Trust macroinvertebrate team. That's Nick Maselko, Peter Gunnis, Sarah Pelleccia. It's great being out in the field with you. Thank you for your your insight and your expertise and your ID and your smiling faces on, on field days. It's, it's been a blast and I hope you come out with me this spring too. <laughs> and uh, thank you to all our partners here, Isaac Walton League of America, Strata Router Research Center, and, and Jim Henriski for his amazing photography of these macros. So I just wanna open it up to any questions. Thank you, MP. Um, that, that was really awesome. Um, really appreciate your work, Maria Paula. We've been doing a lot of this work for years, and it's really awesome to see it in front of us and explained. Um, so thank you. That was, that was really awesome. And we do a lot of water quality sampling, but the macroinvertebrate sampling is one of the most important because it's, it tells a story over time. A lot of our other water sampling is just a moment in time. So it's whatever that water is that day. These macroinvertebrates tell a much bigger story. So thank you for telling that story. Um, so questions. We had some in the chat box here. The first Ooh. one came from David Robertson. Oh. Um, <laughs> it, it was quite early on, and I'm not quite sure what it was referencing. But okay. I'll ask it anyway. It's, yeah. not a, 
It's not really a question. He says, Duns, question mark, Skinners slash Skimmers, question mark. It was pretty early on. It was one of your yeah, first slides. He's referring to the Mayfly life cycle. So when they emerge, they're called Duns. Um, they're pretty vulnerable to fish at that point. You know, they've molted, they've emerged, but they haven't quite, they haven't taken flight yet. And once they take flight, they're known as spinners. So if you've ever been kayaking or you're out in the water in the summertime and you see the mayflies zipping around, those are the spinners. But they have this kind of pre-phase when they've kind of crawled out of the water, they're called duns. And you imagine just living that whole two year journey, you make it, cause it's brutal being a mackerel. Like you, you escape the predators, you escape like the the, any sort of pollutants that are being thrown at you, like the oxygen you just eat by, you emerge and then just fish gets you. It's just, it's, it, it's really amazing the conditions that they survive through. And, but yes, uh, David Robert, no one knows better than David Robertson. Yeah, the, those that, that's the correct terminology for, for mayfly stages. Thanks for pointing that out. I may have zipped by that really quickly. <laughs> I did not know that. That's interesting. It's it's it is tough to keep up with all of these names. Um, it's a nice work. Um, another question from uh, actually kind of um, just a thought from David, which I I agree with. Very interesting. Um, so he he says it would be interesting to sample and compare the small perennial spring-fed tributary draining into Pennypack near the west end of the Pennypack Parkway. Um, because yes. all of because all of that small uh, watershed is protected in the Pennypack Preserve, it's fully wooded and not subject to sedimentation or salt or other impacts of urbanization. I'm so glad he's bringing that up because we've been um, doing some long term planning um, with our, our our staff recently, and we were just talking about that small little little uh, feeder stream just in the northern Parkway. Um, it's it's um it's quite ephemeral in its flow. And so I've been almost like scared to disturb it, but I, our next steps in approaching that site is we're, we're going to do a kind of vegetation survey and also survey the banks to make sure um, it's like in a stable condition. But I, I would love to check, that's been on our list too, to, to survey that um, as long as it's in a stable condition to, to look at the macros there. Thank you. Yeah, it would be fun to get into that into that tributary, but it, you're right, it's very sensitive back there. Good question, Dr. David Robertson. Thank you for the input. Um, and then the next question comes from volunteer all-star Nick Maselko. Ooh. Says, uh, the pond by the center is also interesting and has unique limnephlidid caddisflies. If volunteers are needed to sample turwood, he would be happy to help. Uh, thank Great. you, Nick, for that comment. Um, Nick is our ID whiz. If you guys, he's he's really good at IDing them, and he's constantly like wading in and finding new new taxa that we hadn't surveyed. So, yeah, I'd love to do turwood next um, this spring. And the pond, we're actually in the process of um, restoring that site too. So, I we should add that to our rotation as well. Absolutely. And um, speaking of Turwood Run, we do have a stream keeper here tonight, uh, Dennis Cunningham. That is his site since since about 2014. Um, but I don't think we have done macroinvertebrates there. So um, when we do that, we'll have to bring Dennis out because he knows that site better than anybody, um, anybody else for the most part. Um, speaking of volunteers as well, quick plug for them. Nick and Peter are on this call. They helped us train um, the stream keepers last spring and to actually get certified with the Isaac Walton League of America. So we'll be calling on some of those volunteers this spring, which some of you are on this call. I see Amy um, and a couple of others. So we'll be calling on you guys to help us expand this research this spring. So we're excited for that. And uh, thank you for getting trained and certified. And thank you, Nick and Peter for helping us. Next question yeah. comes from Jeff Clark. I know that name. He says, what substances other than road salt cause the level of chlorides to be elevated? In other words, outside of the winter season, what causes chloride levels to be elevated? So um, if you think about, so when we have a, a winter storm coming up, just like the one this, this coming weekend, while all our townships you know, and our residents, we, we salt ahead of time. And 
So a lot of times we'll either get um, some snow and some rain falling too instead, or the, when the snow melts afterwards, all that salt is carried not only into the creek, but it also percolates into the soil itself. So like think about the, the whole journey down from the side of the road into the banks and then finally into the creek, not all of that washes into the water. Some of it is retained by the soil and even you know, in the springtime into the summer, as it continues to rain, that salt will continue to leach into the, the creek and, and all the water beds. So there's almost like a, a residual element to salting. And it's especially bad if we over salt because then you just have excess salts constantly leaching. And that paired with warmer temperatures of water in the summer makes it like especially stressful for macros in the summertime. That's another reason why we're doing uh, riparian buffers uh, plantings by these the creek itself and the streams because it's helping shade out the water and cool it down so they're not quite as um, like heat stress. Do you have something to add to that, Kevin? Uh, I know you're you're the guru, the salt watch guru. Oh, uh, you kind of nailed the overall um, what they're researching. I mean, this is still kind of new research. Um, Dave Bressler's on the call from Stroud Water Research Center. Um, he doesn't have to talk. He worked all day, but I know that Stroud <laughs> is they're actively looking into all of this, and they're, we're not just studying winter salt watch anymore. It's it's year long salt watch effectively, but there's still a lot of research to be done, and we're learning what we can. But as uh, Maria Paula said. We can do we can do better ourselves, um, reducing our salt watch and doing a lot of things she mentioned tonight. So, yeah, just echoing you. Um, we're excited to be doing this research because it's it's still early on and it's adding to the greater cause of it. So, um, we're excited to keep doing it and see where it leads us and working with the great partners we've mentioned. Great question. Thank you for that, Jeff. Then we have some comments, just people saying, oh, Peter, he's happy to help this year. Appreciate it. Uh, Sarah says the same. I'm not sure which Sarah that is, but I think it's Pelletia. Uh, that's our Sarah. <laughs> that's our Sarah. Got it. <laughs> uh, phenomenal presentation. Thank you very much. Peter says done equals sub imago and spinner e equals imago. Oh, yeah. There's a... <laughs> I'm, I'm definitely not an expert on that, but there's like, it breaks down into further terminology. Um, it, it's with like caddisfly, you, you get very different. You don't get like the nymph and then different emergence stages. There, there you might get like a, the eggs and then it's a gelatinous mass and then it's like a larva and then it's a pupa and it's like amazing if you look into the life cycles of these like I don't you just thought they were bugs and they come out at some point but it's amazing how intricate like and and involved and perilous each step of the life cycle is like highly recommend looking into this if, if this is of interest. Yeah, you're right. The more and more I learn about them um, since since day one, when I knew there was a bug under the rock in the creek, it's just it blows my mind. And then when you go to macroinvertebrate.org and you zoom all the way in on a mayfly gill, it's like, what? Um, so it, it, it's just mind blowing the more and more you go into this stuff. And your pictures tonight really kind of showed you how how far you can go into this. Um, and then having all these different people filling in on the chat. There's so much to know about this. It's very exciting. Um, and then as Dave, another comment from David, uh, Dr. David Robertson says, research has shown that once a watershed has been urbanized, as little as a 10% chance, a change in, as little as 10% a change in the macroinvertebrate community is detectable. The penny pack is urbanized far more than 10%. We should be realistic about what can be expected in terms of macro community improvement. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely true. I mean, even if we we really improve water quality within the trust, like there's a lot of like pollution sources north of us and things are constantly being developed. I, I think the best we can do is just try to increase awareness 
for some of these um, pollution sources and, and, and encourage people to minimize them. But there's definitely like a, a threshold for how much we can improve. Um, I mean, we just influence the watershed a lot. Um, yeah, I, I think it's, um, what, what I want to see is that as, as few um, individuals as we're finding of these sensitive taxa, we can at least maintain that level, maintain their presence. Because if you think about their abundances being so small, and then you think about their emergence chances and their reproductive chance, you know, it's it just seems like you want to do all you can to at least stabilize what we have. Um, but it's, it's true, I, I tend to run on the idealistic side. So, <laughs> um, but anything we can do to, to do our part, I think is, is still important, even if we just maintain what we have. And that yeah, exactly shows why this research is important. Um, we just gotta keep up the good fight and keep watching what we can do. And I, I will say even like as a scientist, I, 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 I don't wanna make um, like a huge, um, this is just one season of data. So uh, to be able to really um, say a lot about the, the, the status of the watershed and, and the stability of our, our the population of taxa we have, I definitely want to have more seasons under our belt. And yeah, absolutely. So, so more research is required, as, as we always say. <laughs> exactly. And we'll, we'll keep training, working with our partners and the volunteers, and we'll keep it going. Um, we've got three more questions here. If anyone has any more questions, uh, just get them in the chat. And we'll uh, we'll finish up shortly. But we have three more questions. The next one comes from um, President Gilbert High. What is the quantity of water in the creek that comes from the sewage treatment plant? Uh, I don't know. So the the treatment plant, as we know it from the '80s, it no longer runs in that way. It's no longer um, dumping that effluent into the creek. As I know it, it's they've they're much better in terms of their um, their involvement with the creek. They're much more um, water quality friendly, I would say. But I don't, unfortunately, I don't know the details and how they operate. I just know it's not at that level from the '80s. That 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 operation has been shut down, and they're a lot um, they're a lot better. They have a lot. Uh, more neutral impact on the creek. But I, I don't know if, um, if Chris is still on the call, if he knows more. Um, I, I used to know an exact number, but I don't want to, I don't want to give the wrong one here, but um, so Gil, we'll have to get back to you on that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure we can find out um, pretty, pretty easily, or if anyone on the call tonight knows, but we'll get to the next question. We'll save that one for next time. Sure. Uh, Aaron Landis from Wissahickon Trails. Uh, she says, did you do any comparison with your recent data to the data from 1992 to see how the macro communities have changed? That's a good question. So I don't happen to have that data set. Um, and we did not sample in the same spots. So that that the data that Dr. Robertson collected was mostly focused on um, two creeks. One of them was Pennypack Creek. Um, and as far as I know, it was not, he did not look into the tributary. So our research is kind of a, a follow-up to his in that um, we know that the creek is impaired. We know that the water quality isn't great, but we wanted to test his theory about, um, I'm sure it was more than just a theory. I mean, he, he knew the, the streams very well. Um, but we wanted to test out the quality of those tributaries and their dilution effects on the creek, improving the, the water quality, at, at least within the confines of the trust. Um, so I've actually just like haphazardly sampled within the creek itself and actually found some mayfly just below Karen Run and, you know, quite a stretch down. So it is having a dilution effect. Um, likely in that it's kind of 
feeding better water quality below those uh, confluences. Um, but I did not sample in the same spots that he did. So I, I don't think a comparison, yeah, I, I could compare the two data sets. Interesting, good question. Thank you, Aaron, and thanks yeah. for joining us. Aaron does this work with uh, on the Wissahickon Creek with Wissahickon Trails. We oh, do a lot cool. of work with them. So thank you, Aaron, for joining us tonight. Uh, Jeff Clark asks, within the EPT group, which tax is the most sensitive? Is it stoneflies? Yeah. You're yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> he asked that as a question. So Jeff, you're right, it's stoneflies, absolutely. There he is. There's nothing like going to Vermont and flipping over a rock and finding like five, five stone flies right away. I mean, uh, if you haven't done that, I mean, book your trip. It's, it's worth it. I mean, you're still on this call, so you definitely want to see that. So, um, I mean, once, once you learn it, you can't stop. You see a creek, you see a rock, you just, you got to pick it up and you got to see what's there. It's, it's, yeah. it, it's really then, fun. It's, it's really once fun. Once you start learning the taxa and identifying them, this isn't like plants where you're like, oh, I got to get to species. This is like families or, or genus. Like when you, like those levels are, you can actually distinguish them quite well um, without having to go any further to learn more about what they say about water quality. So it's almost like addictive to look under and see what you find once you get um, more expertise in this. So that, that Creek Critter app would be pretty useful that Isaac Walton League has, um, yeah. Absolutely, there's a lot of great resources out there. Um, so we have two more questions and then we're gonna finish up. Nick Maselko again, Gilbert, quantity. Oh, he's answering um, Mr. High's oh, question. Cool. He says, quantity wise, I believe Horsham wastewater is about two MGD and the creek I believe is 12 MGD, but check Horsham wastewater site and the USGS monitors to confirm. Actually check those after, I'll let you guys know. Thank you, Nick. And then a uh, final comment, I think from Peter. When we sampled above Paper Mill Bridge for the Isaac Walton training, we saw more species than before 1990, including mayflies, damselflies, water pennies, which were not seen before 1990. I, I, didn't, I did not know that, Peter. I'm embarrassed to say. Thank you for looking into that. I, I wasn't aware that we found that. Did you know that, MP? I didn't know about the water pennies. Yeah, I didn't either. Yeah. Oh, that's shocking. Well, there you go, Aaron. That kind of answers somewhat of the question because I believe Paper Mill Bridge was one of the sites that he did. He's on the call. He might be able to yay or nay that. Oh, well, that's very interesting. So at least that's one species possibly confirmed if David, um, Dr. David did um, sample at the Paper Mill Bridge. Interesting. Well, I'm overwhelmed. I've learned a lot tonight. Um, so I don't see any more questions or comments in there. Um, again, thank you, Maria Paula, for doing all this work, the volunteers for doing this, and all of you for watching us um, tonight. Um, this is really awesome. Um, the Penny Pack Trust is happy to have you, and we've, we have a lot of events coming up, actually. So if tonight inspired you to do something for your watershed, uh, February 21st is President's Day, and we're moving Christmas trees to the um, kind of a dried up tributaries or with a lot of erosion and putting the Christmas trees there to trap sediment. Um, so that's on President's Day, that's a Monday. So please sign up and come on out. We also have our free tree on February 5th if you wanna help save some trees and prep for a tree planting on Earth Day. Um, so if you wanna wait till it's nice and warm out, we have a tree planting in April. So we have countless opportunities to get your hands dirty. Um, and then if you want to get, learn more about some of our research, we have great research presentations coming up, some about our rare plants with Sam Mackler, um, some about children in nature from um, Angela Rose from Bernathan College. We also have our No Mo May presentation, which is something we're really looking forward to presenting. We've done quite a bit of research. Um, Sarah Pelletia, uh, intern turned staff, is on the call and she'll be helping us with that, as well as Chris Mendel. So we're very excited for that. That's on February 3rd. And then uh, we're having documenting and managing Pennypack Trust native plant communities. And that is on February 21st, 24th, I should say. So February 24th. So if you're interested in any of our research or volunteering for us, 
Those are great opportunities. And I put the link in the chat to register for almost all of those. If you have any questions, you can reach out to Maria Paula, myself, Chris Mendel, or just call the office. Um, we're pretty available. If um, Yeah, so again, thank you, Maria Paula. Thank you, volunteers. Thank you, our partners. I don't see any more questions in the chat. Um, but if you do have questions, you can reach out to us. Thanks again for joining us from the Penny Pack Trust. Get outside and um, stay warm. We'll see you guys soon. Thank you very much, everyone. Looking forward to the new season's data. We'll be sampling in April. Yes, we'll be sampling in April. And then a macro, um, if you want to see how we actually do this, um, we're scheduling something for May 21st. So you can come out and um, see Maria Paula, our volunteers, um, in action. Yeah, see these macros live. So highly recommend you register for that when that's available. But otherwise, thank you very much for, for attending this talk. Your, your attendance tells me a lot about that people are interested about water quality and learning more about uh, the macros and the, the watershed. Um, and thank you for volunteering. I know a lot of you are volunteers with us. Um, and any questions you have, most of you have my email. So feel free to reach out. But otherwise, uh, thanks for joining and have a great rest of your evening. All right. Bye, everyone.